dragged me off to school and taught me how not to play the game. I didn't mind if they groomed me for success or if they said that I was just a fool. So I left there in the morning with a goth tucked underneath my arm, the half-assed smiles and the book of rules. And I asked this God a question and by way of firm reply, he said, I'm not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. So to my old headmaster and to anyone who cares, before I'm through, I'd like to see my prayers. I don't believe you. You got the
is not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. The album was uh, recorded not far from, from here. Um, in the then newly opened studios of Island Records, to whom we were still affiliated through the Chrysalis mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. distribution deal, or label arrangement they had with Island. And both Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull were, in a way, the guinea pigs for their new studio. And uh, being, a, as I think I recall, a converted church, Basing Street, it had, by the standards of then, all the latest in technology and the latest in studio ideas. Unfortunately, many of them were wrong, <laughs> and the studio was really very, very difficult to work in. Both studios, both Studio One and Two, and um, I think Zeppelin has maybe a slightly easier time. They were in a smaller studio, I think, downstairs, and we were in a very big room upstairs most of the time. So it was a very difficult album technically to make because we just didn't know what we were hearing, and it, it just everything sounded bad in the room. Everything sounded jarring and unpleasant. And when it came to, to mastering the record, a lot of my confidence you know, had gone out of, the, out of the whole process. I mean, it really didn't sound to me a good album. It, it still sounds, in many ways to me, an album fraught with um, a lot of later modification in terms of trying to EQ the um, stereo masters for the cutting. And indeed, I, I listened to some digital reworkings. I mean, just denoising and EQing of the original master tapes, which miraculously have been found. I mean, the first generation so master these have been lost for... Well, years, lost, lost in the sense that they were amongst my reclaimed collection of Jethro Tell masters, but uh, out of, I mean, I guess thousands rather than hundreds of tapes of one sort or another, some of these things in ancient boxes with labels that don't necessarily relate to the contents any longer, that it is quite difficult to pin things down. But anyway, yes, they, they did, like many other tapes before them, surface having been away for a while at other people's studios or left, you know, in some uh, cutting room in America or somewhere, you know, finally these things have, by and large, found their way home to me over the last few years since I've, um, uh, through the release of compilations and box sets and all yeah. the rest of it, had to try to lay my hands on it all. So did the recording take longer than it might otherwise have done because of this studio? Well, Jethro Hotel, like a lot of bands then, was necessarily given a, only a very finite time in which to make a new record because the, the demands to, to get out and develop the potential of the band as a live act in different countries was, was you know, really... I mean, it was a very strong sense of, of need, both on the part of record company, management, audiences in other countries, and for us as musicians to really get out there and and uh, explore that, that, that wide world. So I think we probably had, I mean, I seem to recall that when we were working on this was either side of Christmas. And it seems like we probably had three or four weeks to do it. And as I say, two or three pieces we came in armed with as rehearsed and worked out pieces. Other songs like Locomotive Breath, for example, were very much um, contrived on the spot mm. um, and very unsuccessfully in terms of an attempts to make the record. It was uh, finally, I mean, this is artistic rather than technically a problem, but it was just that we couldn't somehow get the thing to click at all. It was just, I, I was obviously not getting across the way I wanted this song to, to sound to the other guys, and um, it ended up with me sitting out in the studio. These were the days before click tracks and things. So, um, I sat in the studio to be a click track for four and a half minutes or whatever by playing hi-hat and bass drum all the way through the track and then overdubbed to that with the rest of... Uh, well, then I, then I added some guitar parts, electric guitar parts and acoustic guitar parts, and then uh, tied on, on the front of that was John Evans's piano intro, and then Clyde Bunker overdubbed the toms and the cymbals, and Martin came and added uh, the other electric guitar part to it. So it was, it was one of those strange songs. It was actually... I'm not saying we weren't all in the room at the same time. We were probably all there that day, but it was certainly... It was, it was more like a, a later Pink Floyd recording than a Jethro Tull recording, in the sense it was made up out of uh, and, and a lot of overdubs of parts, and no one really knew what the end song was going to sound like, except me. <laughs> but it, it does sound like a live song. It sounds like the sort of thing that you, know, you, you could walk on stage and play 
almost spontaneous. Well, that, that doesn't that, sound like a. That's kind of lucky because that's what we've had, that's what we that's what we've had to do for the last twenty five years: of walk on stage and play it live. And like many songs, you know, sometimes these things that get put together in in the studio, um, very artificially, end up translating into great live songs. And sometimes they really don't. Mm. So you had a larger studio than Led Zeppelin. Was this something to do with pecking orders? It had nothing to do with pecking orders because we we would have been much more comfy in the in the smaller room, which which didn't sound quite as bad. Um, I think we did actually do some sessions in the smaller room, which is why I'm saying that. But it it just had to do with Zeppelin had booked the place before we did and got the more cosy environment because the big studio was the you know larger part of the church that had been converted, I guess, and uh, was really more. I mean, orchestral size or. Yes. You know, it wasn't really a yes. it wasn't More really a rock group kind of studio, because yeah. everybody liked cozy studios in those days. It was um, you know, like places that that kind of had a an atmosphere, an not 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 the Abbey Road kind of anonymity of uh, of the more traditional orchestral or big band studio. That what was were Led Zeppelin doing? Was I suppose that would have been about their third album, wouldn't it? Yeah, I can't remember what it was. It was it was uh, I Zeppelin. We, we'd already toured with Zeppelin in '69. We were their support band. And um, although, you know, we all got on well with Jimmy Page and Peter Grant, the manager, and even with John Bonham, if you, you know, provided in a sort of a generous <laughs> mood as opposed to some of the, <laughs> some of the um, hard to handle moments that he, that he was capable of providing. But uh, for some reason, probably entirely unimportant and uh, lost in the mist of time, Robert Plant and I never got on. Um, with hindsight, whatever, whatever the reason or reasons were, I'm absolutely mm. prepared to take mm. uh, take the blame for because I, I do recall, in what I thought was was good spirit, you know, making some not badly intended uh, comment in in Melody Maker, saying with uh, with my lyrics and Led Zeppelin's music, you know, we could be we, we could be quite a good little rock and roll band or something like that. And of course, I, I was just so stupidly, uh, you know, um, heavy handed about that. Not remembering, of course, that Robert Plant actually wrote the lyrics. and the lyrics. that, um, But one thought at that time of Zeppelin as being still a kind of a blues-based band, who's, most of whose music and a lot of the lyrics of, you know, from early on were not lyric writing so much as just sort of taking ideas that were, were very you know, traditional in the white middle-class reworkings of the, of the Willie Dixon uh, yes. repertoire. So it didn't seem to me I was saying anything particularly hurtful, but of course I probably wasn't recognizing the the things that the other anthemic yeah. contributions uh, to the world at that time like um stay away to heaven which it, uh, you, you're both using like aqualung is sort of still sunday morning fair on classic rock yeah. stations throughout north america you both use recorders at this time don't you is oddly it, yes which is a and uh, on, only a few days ago i was just on the phone to martin bar saying martin have you got a recorder because i really think you should do it like it is on the record you know you and and Andy should play these two recorder bits with genuine Yamaha plastic school recorders, you know. No, sub, no flutes, no, con, no really. substitutions. Pardon me? But this is what they recorded on, are they? I don't know what they were recorded on. I was way back, but, um, you know, whatever. I mean, they were just things you bought in the, the local school supply shop, you know, yeah. little plasticky yeah. thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that that... But then probably, you see, that, that wouldn't be so unlikely because that was what you did at school. That was almost... I think for, for many people, their first ever shot at playing a musical instrument was at school, picking up the, the school recorder and having a go. Mm. So I guess that, in a way, sort of it does, it was likely to find its way into the, the music of people like Led Zeppelin or Jethro Tull or, or Gentle Giant, for that matter. And uh, mm. it is um, it's really quite a horrid instrument in a way, but it, um, you know, in the sense that it's a fiddly thing to play and doesn't quite have the strident but it's scream of the of the Irish tin whistle, you know. Yes. Effective if used in moderation. Yes, uh, as as a little as a little bit of colour, it um, it kind of um, takes you through the song. After twenty five years, where does Aqualung stand in the chronicle of Jethro Tull releases? Well, when EMI wanted to to focus on this twenty five year anniversary of the Aqualung album's release and do a, you know, I kind of said, well, you know, sure, I don't want to do that, it's, it's okay, it'd be a chance to clean up and see if we can, you know, repress and at least get a better quality piece of music out there for people to buy or rebuy, 
um, if uh, if they haven't actually bought the CD yet, then um, I couldn't have anything really against it. But I did point out to them that it would appear that in many places Aqualung was not the necessarily the seminal Jethro Tell album that that uh, to a lot of people perhaps Stand Up would be, or, or to many more people probably Thick as a Brick, or even the album Living in the Past, the compilation mm. album that, that that was largely, you know, it would be. Um, for other people, it would be much later on. I mean, in Germany, for example, it would be as late as 1982 with Broadsword and the Beast, which in its first year of release was infinitely more successful than the Aqualung album, you know, in that first 12-month sales picture. And it's probably still our most our most successful record in Germany, you know, by that standard, you know, of having, you know, in its year of, of being a contemporary album, you know, was far and away the most successful. And and so there's a danger in, over, you know, focusing on that particular album, giving it perhaps the importance of Dark Side of the Moon to, to Pink Floyd. I, I don't think Aqualung is, is in, is, it's not really a very good comparison because Jethro Tell's music before Aqualung and since, um, it's not that Aqualung was a sort of crowning moment where a certain kind of musical idea was at its zenith and then afterwards we just made pale imitations. I mean, we move on a year or two to things mm. like Minster in the Gallery or in the Songs from the Wood or Crest of a Nave or something. I mean, you, you're going to records which musically are really quite different. And I, as a singer, songwriter, flute player, whatever. I mean, if you, going back a couple of nights, you know, working on my own little rehearsals for the next tour, I was, you know, going through um, the song Budapest from Crest of a Nave. Now, I, I could not have possibly have written a song of that detail or that, for me, that sort of roundness and, and interest and, and from a live performance point of view, something is rewarding to do. I couldn't have done that in 1970 or 1971. I mean, I just wouldn't, I didn't have that, I wasn't equipped to do it. Um, but by 1986, I was similarly no longer equipped to do with the kind of naivety and the, the single brush stroke, the kind of music that was evident on Aqualung or Stand Up or whatever. You change, and you sophistication, literally change, is not something that is... Uh, the word sophistication has connotations of being of being almost a bad thing in rock music terms because it's got too smooth and too you, too arty and pretentious and you leave people behind you. But sophistication in the literal sense of mean, meaning just change. You have to accept as you get older you're going to refine and, and want to deal in terms of your own refinements and your own degree of sensitivity and engagement with the musical substance. You know, that strange jangling conglomerate of notes and rhythms that, that it, what, what intrigues me and moves me now is something that is necessarily more complex and, and, and more um, layered than would have been the case when I first started. I still enjoy listening to Muddy Waters. I, I love listening to very simple, direct music. Um, but I don't enjoy playing it very much because I, I just feel I need more substance. I need more more to hang my hat on as a performer and, yeah. and as a songwriter. So just just by comparison, then, you know, something like Budapest from Crest of Bernay, for me, is a kind of, is a much more, uh, to me, a more fitting example of Jethro Tull or Ian Anderson stroke Jethro Tull uh, at its best, um, more so than perhaps Aqualung, which is, go you know, is a good record with a bunch of good songs on it, many of which, you know, come in and out of the Jethro Tell set. But I, I, I would just say that it was, um, you know, thank God it was a good rather than, uh, by my standards, a good rather than a bad Jethro Tell album that has resulted in, in that degree of interest from people over the years.